So, uh, forgive me for breaking the flow of visual images and indulging in a certain amount of abstraction, but the other speakers have very fortunately led me in that direction anyway. Different societies have their own ways of treating valuables. Perhaps the best example is a great treasure deposited at Toulouse at the end of the first of the second century BC. No archaeological evidence survives, but it was described in a series of written sources which can create confusion at every turn. The usual reconstruction is this. The treasure was composed of gold and silver, looted by goldsmiths from the Greek sanctuary at Delphi. It was taken to their homeland, where it was deposited in a lake. During a later period, the metalwork was recovered and fell into private hands. It should have been delivered to, to Rome, but instead it disappeared. So over the course of time, it changed from a collection of sacred objects to a source of private wealth. Every part of this story has been questioned, but several points stand out. The valuables accumulated at Delphi were stored inside the building, but their deposition in water would conform to common practice in the barbarian world. Their ultimate fate was to lose their special character. The sources do not agree about the course of events. One suggests that the treasure was cursed because it had been stolen from a sanctuary. It had to be submerged in order to control its power. Another text implies that it was deposited in the ground, but in this case the translation is disputed. The collection was said to contain ingots, suggesting that it was originally destined for recycling. If it was buried at Toulouse, as some commentators believe, we would describe it as a hoard. But if it was sunk in a lake, was it a votive deposit? We face similar questions in reviewing the archaeology of hoards, but the problem is compounded because this distinctive phenomenon extended from the Neolithic period to the Viking Age. I'm hardly qualified to talk about the end of this sequence, but I can begin this contribution by saying that as many explanations have been offered for the Staffordshire's hoard as they have for the treasure at Toulouse. Did the hoard found in the Midlands contain the weapons of a defeated war band, like the trophies displayed on battlefields in classical world? Were its contents lost by chance, or were they intended to have a longer history? Comparison with the metalwork looted from Delphi only adds to the uncertainty. Were the contents of the Staffordshire hoard destroyed to curtail their power, or was their metal content always more important? Remember that the treasure deposited at Toulouse included ingots. If the literary sources are confusing, so are our own, so are our own accounts. When the Staffordshire finds were first published, people were uncertain whether they were a hoard. But the problem is of our own making, for we invented the concept in the first place and did so for reasons that were entirely a product of their time. The category was devised as a way of putting artifacts in order, and the reasons why different objects occurred together seemed less important. Hoards were rather like graves in preserving an association between different kinds of objects, but the wider context played little part in studies of this kind. My contribution reviews some approaches to prehistoric hoards and a few of the issues that we've learned from a few of the lessons we've learned from studying. The work of two scholars was important from the outset. One was a Swedish archaeologist, Oscar Montinius, who investigated the contents of hordes and burials across the length and breadth of Europe. More than a hundred years ago, this society, this very society here, published his analysis of British Bronze Age chronology. It was immediately criticised by other specialists and soon forgotten. This was unfortunate, since his findings anticipated the results of modern research, many of them supported by radio carbon, and were at odds with the dogmatic schemes that dominated 20th century thought, no names. Montinius worked largely from published sources, the most important of which was Sir John Evans' book on ancient bronze implements. Evans' work is interesting, as he pursued not one agenda, but two. He was concerned with the associations between different kinds of objects, but he also considered why they were found together. He distinguished between valuables that had been buried for safekeeping 
and groups of artefacts, and specifically metal in this case, assembled by a smith. There might be stores of newly made objects awaiting delivery to a customer, or collections of scrap metal brought together for recycling. His approach remained influential for a long time and was endorsed by Gordon Child half a century later. What neither of them discussed in any detail was why so much material was buried and never recovered, nor did they consider where it happened. But these questions were investigated by continental scholars. Today, it seems ironic that the first studies treated hoard finds and grave finds together. Both collections provided snapshots of the objects that circulated at the same time as one another. They were claimed as closed associations, yet subsequent work has shown that graves were sometimes reopened and that Bronze Age and Iron Age hoards could contain artifacts that were already old when they were buried. These anomalies were overlooked, allowing researchers to propose a chronology that would apply to material found in other contexts, settlement sites, and rivers were especially productive. Eventually, the same approach extended to the Neolithic period. Other problems went largely unrecognised in his early research. The first was the presence of axes in both Neolithic and Bronze Age hordes. While such tools could would have played a practical role in each period, they were made of different materials. Copper and bronze artefacts can be melted down and reworked, but the same approach does not extend to stone tools. It was obviously wrong to restrict hordes to groups of metalwork. More striking was another relationship. As long as chronological problems predominated, hoard finds and grave goods could be treated on equal terms. But it became increasingly apparent that their relationship to one another was much more complex. The same types of material might be buried with the dead in one phase and in hordes during the following phase and vice versa. Among the most obvious examples are the weapons which feature in early Bronze Age burials in Britain and then in Middle Bronze Age hordes. Similarly, the objects employed as great goods in one region might feature in the hordes of a neighbouring area. None of these relationships was confined to pre-Roman archaeology. Taken together, these observations cast doubts on whether hordes were a self-contained phenomenon and suggested that during certain phases and regions, these deposits formed only part of a larger system. In this case, there may be a simple explanation. Perhaps it was considered appropriate to deposit funeral gifts with the dead during one phase and to remove them to a separate location during another period. Further complications affected the relationship between hordes and other kinds of deposits. They include the deposit artifacts found in water, epitomised by the treasure of Toulouse. Many writers observed that the kinds of weapons that accompanied the dead were also discovered in rivers. In early Bronze Age Britain, daggers were commonly buried with the dead, but in the following phase they were replaced by rapiers which were deposited in water. In the same way, the artefacts from the Swiss site of Aten have given it name to a phase of the European Iron Age and to a style of Celtic art. They were found where a river enters a lake, but elsewhere at the same times were buried with the dead. Again, these relationships were not confined to the pre-Roman period. If the same types of artifacts were present in water and dry land, investigators needed to think in terms of a tripartite relationship between the material placed in water, grave goods, and the contents of hordes. And what applies to the collections of objects known as hordes is just as relevant to single finds, but in the past they were undervalued because they were not associated with other, with other artifacts. Unfortunately, the hordes were particularly diverse, and many of their contents were different from those in graves. Often they included parts of objects that remained intact in other contexts. The Bronze Age swords and spearheads found in rivers provided the most obvious example. Does this mean that Evans was correct in relating the contents of hordes to the activities of smiths? The question is not restricted to Bronze Age archaeology, and similar questions arose in Iron Age studies. 
It dominated the earliest interpretations of the metalwork in Snettisham and Norfolk, although current thinking is that the site was a sanctuary. Current thinking, I suspect, is perhaps a way of saying that, that's why I think uh, it's still controversial and mustn't quite say dogmatic. Was the working of metal consistent with such a specialised role? It would have been true of the country. It would have been true of the treasure stolen from Delphi, for it included a large number of ingots. But does the same argument apply to the British evidence? Certain observations are not in doubt. Large quantities of metal were recycled from an early date, making it difficult to relate individual artifacts to a source. Hoards not only contain broken pieces, they can contain ingots, slag, and casting jets and they may also be associated with moulds and making new objects. It's unnecessary to sever the connection. So I've turned two pages, I think. <laughs> it was, if it was unnecessary to sever the connection between many, but not all of the hordes, and the work from metals in the Bronze Age and Iron, is this the right approach to take? From John Evans to Gordon Child, the emphasis was on the activities of the smith, who was regarded as a technician with special skills. There's little doubt the most complex artifacts were made with considerable virtuosity, but this approach was unduly influenced by 19th century notions of technology. Evans was a successful businessman, and his work reflects the notion of progress exposed expressed by the three-age system, in which stone was superseded by bronze and bronze by iron. This was thought to document a growing mastery over the natural world. The smith was both an entrepreneur and a laboratory scientist. This interpretation seems unlikely in the light of what is known about the status of smiths in traditional societies in the old and new worlds. Their activities can take place in seclusion, where their success depends on the performance of appropriate rituals. They are magicians as well as technicians, and the all they process can be thought of as an organic substance that grows beneath the ground. As someone who studies the Neolithic period, I'm aware of the megalithic tomb called Wayland Smithy and the implications of its Anglo-Saxon name. Working metal drew on supernatural powers. But there are problems with any approach which depends on comparison with distant regions in the past. In this case, I prefer to work for more local archaeological evidence, which raises similar doubts about the mundane, or do I mean profane, character of prehistoric metalwork. Mold fragments are especially revealing. They could be found in settlements and hordes, but in Ireland they were also deposited in an artificial pool outside Hockey's Fort the precursor of the Royal Centre at Navan, where they were discovered together with pieces of human skull. Closer to home in Essex, another group of sword moulds was in a natural water hole associated with cremations. Similar collections were buried in both entrances of a late Bronze Age defended enclosure at Springfield Line. During the same period in Scandinavia, mould fragments were associated with cult houses and burial mounds. The most extensive workshop in Bronze Age Norway was on the same site as the cemetery, and the same was true in Sweden. The metalwork found in British hordes poses similar problems. It could be broken by various methods, but it seems as if certain objects were violently destroyed. <coughs> Studies of Bronze Age scrap hordes in different parts of Europe show that particular parts of the object were selected for burial, while others must have been recycled. And I've just made this side here that one of the commonest features is to preserve a sword hilt but not the blade. And that goes across much of the Bronze Age of Central Europe. The proportions of different fragments then vary between phases and regions. This does not negate an association with metalworking, but the transformation of these objects must have been governed by rules that had nothing to do with ensuring an efficient outcome. A modern business model is inappropriate. The simplest explanation, but it is only one of many, is that the smith had to offer part of the stock of metal to celebrate a successful out outcome. Material had been taken from the earth and subjected to an extraordinary transformation. 
Now an agreed fraction was returned to the ground. The question to ask is how far this could form to a general pattern. One way of addressing the problem is to consider the sighting of wards as well as their contents. And this has been an important development here and on the European Union. Until comparatively recently, their placing in the landscape was largely overlooked. Either it was considered as a clue to the positions of settlements, or was associated with places where smiths could obtain a dependable supply of fuel. But studying the locations of board sites on the ground and not just on the map or the computer can be more informative. This method sheds light on three related questions. Again, the pages are stuck together. Were hoard sites intended as stores or temporary hiding places? Were the places with evidence of metal production located according to social conventions? And were the contents of the hoards meant to be recovered, or were they intended to remain in the ground? I begin with a field study of over 300 fine spots of later Bronze Age hoards and single finds between the English Channel and the Fenwick, which show that the majority were deposited in very similar settings. Field work by David Duncan and David Yates to be presented at the Bronze Age Forum later this month showed how often they were associated with the heads of streams, the tributaries of major rivers, confluences, and other sources of fresh water. At Broadwood in Shropshire, a site to which I shall return, excavation showed that over a hundred broken weapons had been buried in a pit cut into the side of a spring. The positions of many of these holes are so predictable that they cannot have offered effective hiding places, and that's why metal detectorists have been so have been able to target them in recent years. To my mind, this has two implications. If these collections were associated with the working of metals, smiths followed accepted conventions in choosing where to bury this material. The fact that similar places contain so many artifacts suggests that they were meant to stay in the ground. If the fine spots had a, had a special significance, few of them were settlements. That's why hordes are rarely found in excavation. For example, in northern Britain, metalwork dating from the early Bronze Age has been found in conspicuous locations, including rock outcrops, passes, and watersheds. A few command views of the sunrise or sunset at the turning point of the year. At one of these sites, People could watch the midwinter sun emerging from behind Ben Nevis, the highest mountain in the world. The Iron Age evidence is important too. Philip to Jersey has shown that coin boards of this period could be buried on these ground facing east, facing south and southeast, a feature that they share with the entrances of houses and enclosures. Another point is equally significant. From the Neolithic period to the Iron Age, hordes are associated with older monuments like barrows or with striking features of geological literature. The distinction between them is important for heritage managers, but lack the same significance in the past. This may have a bearing on the fine spot of the Staffordshire. Topographical studies offer further insights into deposits of artifacts. Certain forms were common in particular contexts. But this followed the distinction between those buried in dry land and the objects deposited in water. River finds were dominated by weapons, another element shared between the pre- and post roman periods. There were also contrasts between the objects associated with different kinds of water. Swords were in fast-flowing currents and ornaments in bogs or pools. Similar distinctions were less obvious among terrestrial deposits. And a new field work by David Duncan and David Yates has found surprisingly little evidence that particular kinds of metalwork were restricted to specific locations. On the other hand, middle and late Bronze Age hordes and single finds in their study area were associated with local high points and with unusually low-lying positions. Perhaps these places provided access to upper and lower worlds of the type uh, proposed for the Nordic Bronze Age where researchers claim that there is evidence of a tripartite cosmology. There was another problem in supposing that particular kinds of artifact had to be deposited in specific contexts. For the intact objects placed in rivers and lakes 
had such obvious equivalents on dry land, where fragments of exactly the same types could be deposited. In this case, any neat categorization breaks down. It seems as if prehistoric communities were less concerned with typology than the people who study these artifacts today. Perhaps we've been asking the wrong question. Were the fortunes of individual objects determined by their forms or by their histories? It's always seemed ironic that so much time's been spent studying use wear on stone tools, while little attention was paid to similar traces of metalwork until recently. Bronze is well suited to this approach, although iron is not. Even so, it's been possible to show which artifacts have been used for everyday tasks. This method provides information on whether tools have been repaired or weapons have been damaged in combat. It also shows that personal ornaments were worn over long periods of time, even suggesting that specific artifacts were acquired at different stages in a person's life. Even more important, detailed analysis has sought to establish which traces developed over the course of time and which were acquired when objects went out of circulation. It can show that weapons were resharpened immediately before they were buried, implying that they were destined for further use in this world or another one. Most of all, this method can distinguish between the wear and tear experienced while an artifact was in use and the damage inflicted when it was taken out of circulation. An example is provided by the later Bronze Age weapons from the River Thames. Approximately 80% of them had been used in combat, and the proportion showing signs of deliberate damage rose from 20% to 50% over the same period. They had been disabled or destroyed, often with considerable force. Others were exposed to a fire. It might be that these weapons had a special history. It's interesting that Bronze Age and Iron Age human skulls were placed in the river at the same time, and that some of them provide evidence of violent injuries. Some years ago, I made the suggestion that particular types of metalwork enjoyed a particular significance within a restricted area, and that they had lost that aura once they had been passed outside its limits. Here they could be broken and used as raw material. The idea accounted for cases in which intact objects occurred in rivers and similar contexts, while similar types were represented by fragments in hordes some distance away. Sometimes the argument seemed to work, but there was little to indicate a general pattern. Moreover, the difference between such local styles of objects were often so slight that it's unlikely that people dwelt on them in the same detail as specialists on Bronze Age metalwork, who are a cast apart, I think so. Perhaps the feature that determined the fate of any particular weapon was not its form, but its history. Whether it had been inherited from a renowned warrior or used in a famous battle, that is why it received special treatment and had an extended afterlife. Now, by this point, I'm approaching familiar territory, for it's the approach taken to deposits of war booty in northern Europe. It also touches on some of the interpretations of the Staffordshire War. But does this interpretation have to rely on analogy? I think not. Event excavation in Glense Valley in northeast Germany has already identified what seems to have been a Bronze Age battlefield marked by concentrations of damaged weapons and human remains. They extend along the course of a river where most of the bodies seem to have been left where they fell. But the excavators have suggested that even here, a more formal collection of personal ornaments was placed in the water. The evidence is suggestive, but by no means clear cut. It's mirrored by the Iron Age archaeology of sanctuaries in Gaul and the finds from the water of that area. But I'll conclude with an incident example. Tobias Mertz has re-examined one of the hordes I mentioned earlier in this presentation, the collection of weapons in the spring at Broadwood, with a radiocarbon date between 980 and 820 BC. It's one of a distinctive group in southern England and the Welsh borderland, where previous investigation suggested that the massive spearheads in these collections were too unwieldy to use. His work has identified combat damage. At the same time, the contents of these hordes received drastic treatment before they were deposited in the ground. 
they have been collected and set on fire so that their contents fused together in a solid mass before they were buried. Mertz compares their treatment with the equipment of defeated war bands in Scandinavia during a later period. Perhaps his interpretation would extend to the treatment of weapons in the tent. It's too soon to say, but important to find that out. Now, at several points, this account of prehistoric wars touches on similar issues to the finds in Stanford. I've talked about the violent destruction of objects, the enigmatic role of the smith, the choice of natural places for deposits of valuables, and the importance of considering the histories of the artifacts selected for burial in the ground. It's, true, it's clear that in this country we need to initiate a dialogue between prehistorians and early medieval archaeologists, for we seem to be addressing similar issues. I cannot explain the role of the Staffordshire Hall, but I do suggest that it could have formed only part of a wider phenomenon. Thank you.